All right. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the introduction. And thanks to each of you for taking the time this afternoon to, uh, to come out to the seminar. I'm not sure whether it's mandatory or not. <laughs> but, uh, either way, I appreciate you, you, you being here. Um, I'm happy to have this as being as informal as you like. So if you have questions, as you see something that I'm going through, please uh, interrupt, raise your hand, just shout out. That's, uh, that's totally fine. In fact, I would encourage it. Sometimes it's a, it's a bit to remember when you get towards the end of a presentation. Uh, I really want to thank my good friend, Ahmed Dingra, for the invitation. I also want to thank Tammy Landry for all the efforts she did in coordinating everything. It went supremely smoothly, surprisingly smoothly, actually. Um, and it's such a delight to be back in face to face and in person. I wasn't sure we were, you know, there's a point probably we were all there. We weren't sure if we were going to be doing this again, you know, guest lectures and visiting speakers and seminar series. And, and it adds such a, 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 a missed element for me, at least. So um, I appreciate that and the fact that we can be here. Right. So I don't have very much time. In fact, I didn't feel like I did. And then I was just 10 minutes ago thinking, oh, my word, I've got already too many slides. So I'm going to go through. I, I tend to speak a little bit fast. Uh, if you want me to slow down. Again, raise your hand and say, dude, just chill out a bit, right? Doing a lot of stuff. Uh, I have been at WSU for 20 years. I am an applied whole tree physiologist. I work at a research and extension center, um, which for me is actually the best possible place to be. You know, hopefully what I'll show you this afternoon will give you a bit of a flavor of some of the work we've been doing over the years and where we think uh, the research at this intersection of biology and technology should, should be going. But I thought I'd begin, for those of you who haven't had a background in, in the Northwest, and I know that some of you have, at Washington State Agriculture. It's very different from, from agriculture in Texas. Apples is the number one ag commodity, right? Almost 2.3 billion, in fact. I think this was a, these data are, are maybe a year or two old. Um, and uh, talking with you earlier today, somebody else thought wheat was going to be a close second. Not even close. Wheat's fourth. It's, it's, it's got, got us fit in behind milk and cattle. And then potatoes, there's a good potato cohort here. I know some grad students working on potatoes. So we're, we're also very interested in that. I see you guys in the back there. Hey, hops, cherries. Cherries is, is the product that I work most exclusively with. Not entirely, but, uh, but almost all of my work is related to cherries. And in fact, last year it was, a, it was over $500 million probably by the fruit of cherries, grapes and blueberries. So we're dominated by high value specialty. Um, and uh, a lot of different crops are grown, over 300, in fact, commercially, but really dominated by these specialty crops. And because I'm a Washington State University faculty, I have to do my, my diligence and say, hey, guys, have you heard of Cosmic Crisp apples? They're on sale now at the HEB, $2.99 a pound, or whatever. I don't, I'm not sure, sure what it is, but $1.98. That is dirt cheap. It's dirt cheap, right? Yeah. You know, the problem, of course, that $1.98, I don't want to get too sidetracked. This is something I I'll tend to do. The grower doesn't get anywhere near enough of that $1.98, by the way. We can get into that a little bit later. But uh, anyways, you guys can imagine the possibilities of, of, of having this wonderful Washington-grown fruit. Um, so just to give you a bit of a flavor before I dig into this one particular area of investigation, there's some of the things that I've worked on over the years, and it includes beginning as an assistant professor in 2002, looking at root stocks that were available now for, for cherry farm, right? So been adopted globally for, for home fruit producers for a long time, right? And we understand the advantages of size controlling root stocks and production efficiencies. We looked at those in cherries. Orchard systems followed quickly thereafter of how do you manipulate the canopy structure to get better production efficiencies, followed by crop load management, looked at plant growth regulators over the years, uh, more recently, we've done a lot of work with cold hardiness and cold tolerance um, and floral biology and fruit set. And then really what I'm going to spend a, more time today is this last point, looking at the ability and the potential and the reasons why you might incorporate or look to incorporate mechanization and automation technologies in, in specialty crop production. One more background slide just to bring you up to speed with this beautiful crop that I work with. This is Rainier cherries you see in the photo on the right, which was bred and developed uh, in the 1960s from the Research and Extension Center that I work at. We've got about 20,000 hectares now, or what is it, 45,000 acres of, of, uh, of sweet cherries, or just a little bit more than that. It's increased steadily. The last three or four years, it's leveled off a little bit, but it has been increasing. The uh, production 
typically is about 220,000 tons. So you can see the range per acre that they are. Everything is irrigated, absolutely irrigated. We work and produce these fruit in a, in a desert. We're on the eastern side of the Cascade Mountains in Washington State, and therefore in the rain shadow from those mountains. We get about 170, 180 millimeters per year where we are, um, and everything is, uh, is irrigated onto. Generally speaking, it's hard to say for the different regions that we grow these fruit, but generally speaking, excellent uh, volcanic uh, loam soils. So it's this desert climate that of course is characterized as you're familiar with in parts of Texas, these, these warm sunny days, a lot of uh, photosynthetically active radiation and cool nights to reduce respiration and increase uh, color and quality and very little rain obviously. So the state of Washington produces 55, usually about 55% of the nation's cherries. It actually is almost 10% of the global production of cherries. And, uh, the uh, fact of the matter is that we are warehouse for cherries. We're, we're, we're big time producers because we don't have very many people in the state. So in terms of exported outside the state, most of it, our fruit does. We, we're the fruit basket for the, for the nation in, in many ways. Apples are similar, about 60% of the nation's apples come out of Washington state every year as well. Pears, I think are similar, aren't they? They're more than, more than yeah, about 90% of the fresh pears. So this is a typical sweet cherry orchard, a mature block. Um, you can see the river in the background, that's the Columbia River, uh, where the water is not applied. It's rather barren, that's cheap grass and sagebrush back there. Uh, that happens to be the Hanford Nuclear uh, Reserve back there as well. No effect on the cherries whatsoever, they're safe. Um, but you can see a wind machine here to help protect from frost. Uh, but that's a typical scene, uh, a lot of growers will have these uh, uh, aquifers, reservoirs that they've built, you can see in the photo here, to provide irrigation in the summer. So it relies upon snowfall in the Cascade Mountains and then a system of dams and then irrigation canals that divert from the Yakima River to provide this, uh, this growing uh, climate. A couple of key trends I want to introduce at the beginning. As you look at a scene at, at about five o'clock in the morning in the Yakima Valley, pickers ready to get out with the ladders and pick cherries. Acreage has been increasing, as I mentioned. You know, an increasing burden and requirement for people. Labor availability to pick the fruit or to prune the trees is decreasing, and the cost of that labor are obviously therefore increasing, right? Picking crews have cell phones. So they're in demand. They know that they're holding the cards. Uh, it's been well documented that uh, picking crews show up at an orchard at 4.30 in the morning, ask the manager, what are you guys paying? They'll actually walk into the orchard, have a look around and see, well, how much fruit is here? How, how much money, you know, quick calculation, what can I make here? And they'll decide if they want to spend the, their time there or not. If they don't, they're, they're going somewhere else to pick fruit. So that places a lot of competition among growers on pickers. Um, that video should play automatically, but I might need to turn off the laser pointer. Yeah. For me, this kind of sums up the challenge that I faced when I was hired. This is an actual video that I took uh, about five years after I was hired. It's a bit old now. It gives you a, a really good impression, more than any bullet points could, of the challenges facing uh, these, these, uh, these farmers. This is a commercial picking crew. She's got a normal picking bucket. She's positioning a 12-foot aluminum ladder there. Uh, somebody else comes into the foreground here. They've picked their bucket. They dump it in there. They slide the cherries over, picks out two or three particularly egregious leaves for some reason, leaves all the others. And now she's finally going up the ladder to pick. Now I stopped the video there because the ladder slips and she drops from about 10 feet and it's a gruesome sight. Actually that doesn't happen, but it could have, it could have happened, right? And in fact, I have seen that happen. And so that summarizes a lot of the concerns. This is an inefficient process and so, one of the things that uh, I set as a goal for my, for my program from the beginning was very simply to improve production efficiency and try to renovate whole systems to get away from that, that situation, that heavy dependency on a dwindling and expensive labor supply. And our, our industry collaborators say repeatedly that the, that the top issue for them is, is understanding how they can improve labor efficiencies. The reason that we focus on cherries for this uh, is because they're, generally speaking, you saw that it was a big tree and they're small fruit, right? Every time you reach out and you make a picking process, you're grabbing a cluster of, of cherries, right? Two cherries, maybe 20 grams into a bucket. 
you grab an apple, you're grabbing 250, 300 grams in each processor. You're, you're picking a lot more efficient. So cherries for me are sort of the sort of the ultimate specialty crop with this high value crop, but it takes a lot to get it harvested in, in the, in the, into the into the markets. So we've approached this from two different general ways. The first of which is orchard systems. And I don't have time to get into the work that we've done over the years just on, on renovating the tree structure and, and uh, to improve efficiency and in collaboration with engineers to look at opportunities for mechanization, which you would say it's a bit crazy perhaps, but hopefully you'll get a feel for our vision of fresh market, mechanically harvested uh, sweet cherries towards the end. So if I think about this, uh, going from left to right with these photos, I'm sort of documenting the process from uh, the season from dormant buds all the way to, to uh, leaf fall at the end of the season. Um, and I'm going to look at different opportunities for mechanization, and they include different times of mechanical pruning, including dormant. We look at pruning pre-harvest, and then we look at pruning here in the, uh, the post-harvest phase. Uh, we looked at artificial pollination and that's another one I don't have time to get into, but we're doing a lot of work on artificial pollination systems here, um, otherwise known as mechanical pollination, um, a thinning uh, of flowers, and, and ultimately, of course, we're interested in harvest. But I want to begin with pruning. This is a video of a field day from several years ago now, but in a commercial orchard. This is sort of what I do with extension work. We organize uh, field days in commercial orchards. We talk to the farmers about what they're doing, what their struggles are. And this was the field man who said, hey, can you prune some of these trees for us, really, so we can see how you do it. Then he's, he's getting everything from the ground here. But pruning behind harvest is the second greatest expense in an annual production budget. And I'll tell you what, it is way more difficult than harvesting. For obvious reasons, right? If we went out to that orchard in, in, uh, in three months, once it once it's, needs to be harvested, I can get ev give every one of you a picking bucket and you can reach out and grab fruit, take them off the tree, put them in the bucket. We go out at this time of year and I ask, and I give everybody pruning shears and say, prune those trees. Right, we're doing things way different. You're all gonna do something very, very different. And you're, to varying degrees, you'll be clueless as, as I was when I started working with cherries, which I hadn't had no ex previous experience with. So that's a 71 second uh, uh, video here. Steep leader architecture for cherries. And he made, I counted the 66 cuts in the time that that video went through. That's about one cut per second. In other words, this guy really knows what he's doing, right? He didn't stop. He wasn't really thinking too much. He was just pruning the tree um, and all from the ground. But the questions that it would ask as, as an extension educator, as a researcher is what were the rules? How long would it take for you to learn this system and then tell somebody else how to do it. How long, I mean, really, it's difficult. There's so much interpretation in, in what you're doing. And by the way, you know, inches matter when you're pruning perennial fruit crops, right? All the great people understand that quite clearly. Pruning back to how many buds dormant pruning provide. The same thing for tree fruit. How do you follow up also, right? How would, you, how would a manager, if you're the manager, how would you follow up and say, that, that's a good job? You've done well. That's going to be a good yield of good quality fruit because of the way that you prune the tree. These are, these are difficult uh, rhetorical questions, really, in, 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 in essence, to, to, just to get you thinking about it. And the ability to mechanize that, I would say, is, is almost impossible. My, my engineering colleagues say, never say it's impossible because they can do it. it just depends on how, how expensive it's going to be and how long it'll take them to figure it out. But, but practically, purposes, it's, it's impossible. But one of the first things that I did. And this came from my inability, by the way, to do all those things as an extension specialist of trying to explain, let's redesign the trees to do a whole bunch of things that are, that are gonna be advantageous. But the main thing behind this architecture, which we developed years ago, which we have called the UFO, is to create simplified pruning rules. And the, the, I've distilled it down. These are the two main ones here that we've come up with. Remove lateral wood with stub cuts. And you can see that illustrated with these side shoots being cut out. And then the second rule is remove the largest of these uprights with stub cuts. And you can see that all, way over here on the left where that basal most limb has been removed and you've got regrowth there. Um, again, I mean, we spend the time talking about this, this pruning system and how it's been adopted uh, around the world in different crops. But the goal is to simplify it. Actually, I'll bet if we were in a UFO orchard and I gave you all offers, you would be able to do it. Probably without much thinking, really. 
In fact, just as a quick aside, I had a high school kid in Prosser uh, who worked for me for two seasons and did all the pruning uh, for me in my UFO uh, test blocks. The only thing he knew about pruning was which end of the shears to grab onto. Really, that was it. And he went off to be a motorcycle mechanic, no interest in horticulture. But the point is, this, this, was, a, this was an individual who could prune these blocks if, effectively without any problems because we've, 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 we've simplified the processes and the thinking in here. Okay? So the UFO, anybody know what that stands for? Some of you have had a bit of time to think about it. It is... <laughs> Unicorn, did you say? Or uniform? <laughs> uniform. Uh, it is, it's close. It's close. It's, it's, it stands for upright fruiting offshoots. So they're all, it's all vertical wood, so it's all upright. They're fruiting, and they're all offshoots, right? They're all sort of, I call it the secondary wood, right? The primary wood is very similar to a lot of grape systems, the vertical shoot positioning in grapes where you have a cord on that's horizontal, and then all the other wood is renewed from that. Not too much time to get into that. But the benefits of that then, if we're saying there's not a lot of thinking, shoot, machine can do that. If I'm saying take every branch that's growing out sideways and cut it off, well, we can do that. There was some of our earlier work, you these, these these saws that were developed originally for, for grapes and running them through one of our test orchards. All those side shoots are being cut off. The benefits, of course, that's very fast. It's, it is relatively uniform and easy to do. And there are a list of drawbacks here. It's not selective. Difficult actually to get too close to that to that leader, right? Because you can see the machine swaying back and forth a bit. Um, concerns depending on where you grow fruit, disease transfer, right? And we get a lot of that from growers. Well, if I've got bacterial canker in that tree there, and you just cut it with the blade, and haven't you just now spread it? And possibly, yeah, uh, th those would be those are legitimate legitimate concerns. But our earliest work in this uh, was showing that doing this process was 13 times faster than doing it by hand. Um, we've also looked a little bit more into this idea of post-harvest hedging. So this is a commercial UFO orchard of cherries, and all of that green tissue coming out into the row is one-year-old shoots that grew out there that I'm saying are going to come off anyway. So we looked at the possibility of doing it after you've removed the fruit. Let's just hedge these back. Now, this hedger is a different machine. It's actually a sickle bar uh, cutting uh, tool that in this case can actually be manipulated to any angle. So we did work where we worked with commercial growers and we first would top the trees and then we would come back and hedge the side, right? So I, mean, I think I only have one or two data slides. So I didn't want it to be really so much about data, but I'll show you some numbers that a master's student in her project generated years ago, comparing hand pruning and machine pruning. Now the machine pruning treatment required three passes on every tree. First we top it, then you got to go down the east side and you come back up the west side. So that's three passes per tree. And here's how it worked out if you just timed it in terms of tr time per, per tree in minutes. So we've got a couple of different years here in the yellow and the blue, but the hand pruning is on the left. This is, these are trained people who do pruning uh, with ladders pruning these trees. And then you got the machine pruning in the middle. And then in the second year, we did a machine pre pruning and then followed up with hand. And you can see the results. It was, 23, 29 times faster than hand, even though, again, we passed each tree three times. Um, and we found that it is clearly related to the speed that you're driving the tractor. The faster you could even make it a bit better. But our optimum is somewhere around two kilometers per hour. Um, and so pretty radical improvements here in, in pruning efficiency. Um, and so now what we're thinking about is I, I mean, I didn't, I'm not going to show you the, the, the data on uh, obvious questions on yield and fruit quality in the next year. No negative effects on yield nor fruit quality in the year after doing this, this treatment. So what we're thinking about now, we haven't done this yet, but I'd love to set up a longer term study where the first year, doesn't matter, you do it all by machine, and walk away. Next year, you harvest the fruit. After harvest, you do a mechanical pre-pruning and then do it by hand. I think the two consecutive years of machine pruning would create a bit of a, uh, a rat's nest of lateral wood that goes down the row because you're not touching anything that's down the row, right? We haven't, we haven't proven nor, nor disproven that, that concept. And then you could get into that cycle. Fully machine pruning with machine followed by hand. Okay, and that's non-selective, right? What I just talked about was hedging. Now we're moving into this concept of robotic pruning. And you're seeing a, a short video here of some students in our, in our lab, uh, demonstrating the six degrees of freedom robotic arm. It's a pneumatic 
uh, pruning head on the end of that. It's uh, this is an apple. We do this. We, we dug up uh, uh, trees from commercial orchards, brought them into the lab, and supported them so we'd have real apple trees to work with. This is the idea. It's slow. It's finding a place, it, but it's actually it's actually making a cut. And the success, right, of all the of any system like that has is down to the components of vision. You got you got to see your target. Then you have to use AI and, and, and plan the path to get there, which can be complicated and then actually make a cut. So subsequent students, this is an example where they've been working in the UFO architecture. These are photos from a commercial UFO orchard where you got that permanent cordon across the base and you can see the vertical upright uh, offshoots here. The vision part is looking at now segmenting the tree from the background, right? If you've got cameras looking at a, at a tree, they simply struggle with depth like, like we don't so much. So we're using stereo images here and trying to identify, and looking at different lighting, uh, trying to identify those uprights so that you can define the targets then subsequently, right? So his work was looking at active lighting or passive lighting. And this very simple example shows that with active lighting on the left in the daytime, they identified successfully the uprights in the foreground. And they used uh, the passive lighting or naturally the same lighting. Uh, the green ones were the ones that are successfully identified by the AI, but the red ones, you can see what those are, right? Those are metal trellis poles. So that's a fail. That's gonna damage the, uh, the, the system. So that was a, a incorrectly identified upright. And then the purple one was, um, uh, was an upright on the far side. It couldn't have been uh, accessed in the, in the images as well. Um, so that's just a, an example of some of the work that's being done to work towards identifying these, these targets with AI. Um, and now I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you where we've advanced it a little bit from the first video. This is a, a, um, a battery powered uh, uh, lopper uh, that's attached to that same robotic arm in the field now. And so here's your vision system with this, this, set of, this set of cameras you can see just below there. Uh, very similar to the uh, game station uh, cameras, stereo images. So these are RGBD, um, so the colors plus, plus depth and stereo images. And uh, this you can be found on, on YouTube, as you can see, but this is an example of this past spring, uh, a successful pruning cut. And the first, so far as I know, successful robotic pruning in a UFO architecture. So the point being, I'm always interested to see what comes up afterwards, by the way, on this. I have no control of that, I don't think. And I'm hoping it's not interesting. That's a flaw in the YouTube thing. But the point here, right? Simplified pruning and training systems enable mechanization. When we make it as we make it so it's easy to do, then 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 robots can get in there and do that. And uh, so we were we were very excited to, to demonstrate that for the first time here on that video. We're also looking at reducing the complexity of the decision making that the camera and AI has to go through. And that's uh, being led also by my colleague, Dr. Manos Karki of, hey, could you, could you just have touch screens and just have, how hard is it for an operator to sit in an office and just tap it and say, yeah, prune there, prune there, and then have the arm actually do that. So this remote control concept is another one that um, we're, we're pursuing as, as well in theory. So that's the, that's the pruning piece. I wanna just touch very, very briefly on the thinning work, right? So in tree fruit, they flower a lot more than, than necessary. This is the way to put it, right? So crop load management, in other words, thinning and getting a balance of quantity and quality of fruit is, is critical for apples. And so this work is looking at, that's the same robotic arm, different end effector. Can we physically remove a percentage of the flowers and just leave the flowers that we want, the numbers of flowers that we want to have fertilized, right? So that sounds pretty straightforward. Right now, that's being accomplished manually. Growers have gone through decades of looking at chemical sprays to put on flowers to, to, to kill a portion of the flowers and leave just the ones that they want. But that is, that is uh, almost random in its, in its, in its uh, efficacy. So to avoid that, growers are now spending 1,800, I've, I've heard up to $3,000 an acre to send people through to pluck flowers off at the flowering stage. So it's a big deal. And so we're looking at, at can we use the same idea, right? A, a vision system to find the target. And then in the end, this is actually, you can't really see it very well. It's actually a little like a little weed whacker 
the little electric motor that spins some thin nylon uh, ropes, strings, can you find flower clusters and say, I want one, take out four, and just leave one. That's, that's where we're going. This video is, is uh, just taken uh, this past spring. Uh, Ron John uh, there in the background is a grad student working on that. But I guess the key point I also want to make here is look at the orchard system. This is not a complicated, big old structure. That everything's right there in the, in the face of the robot. It's easily accessible. Very modern uh, Apple production systems that you see there. Um, okay, I want to talk then uh, lastly about getting into this harvest idea. So we started um, actually years ago thinking, well, what affects harvest efficiency to begin with? Let's get some baseline numbers on how fast or how well people are able to pick fruit right now. So we studied some of these factors like the canopy architecture, the fruit yield, environmental conditions even, uh, even the motivation you could say, right? The means of reimbursement, are you being paid hourly? Are you being paid piece rate? And how does that influence how well you work? And even then, of course, how much? What we found is overwhelmingly actually the picker makes the biggest difference, right? So if you're a good picker, you pick a lot faster than a bad picker. It's really not much more complicated than that. Um, the problem of course is the good pickers tend to be the, uh, the PC, but older, older folks uh, who have 10, 20, 30 years of experience with picking and know where to put the ladder to get maximum efficiency, they work hard, uh, and they, they, they're, they're, they're fast. Um, and uh, lastly is this presence of absence of stems issue, which I'm gonna get into. A postdoc in my lab uh, uh, years ago, uh, Yanis Ampatsidis, who's now uh, at um, CSU, pardon me, he's actually now at Florida, designed this system, which we call the labor monitoring system. Um, and in essence, it was a tool that allowed us to track harvest efficiency. So this is a four-wheeler uh, that's pulling a, a trailer. On that trailer is a pallet scale, right? So that bin, that's a cher standard cherry bin there, that white, that white bin, that's where all growers use these. The fruit would get harvested into buckets, as you saw at the beginning, and then dumped into these bins, yeah? So we put the bin on a scale, and then we issued each picker an RFID wristband that you see there. And then above that, you can see the RFID reader, which connected to the, to the laptop. So basically what we did was we went out to 13 different orchards, commercial orchards, took four pickers that were the same people into each orchard. So we had that picker part uniform. But we, at each block, we also took at least four to 10 uh, of their, their crews who were willing to volunteer to follow their efficiency. Basically the process was simple. They would pick fruit as they normally would, bring the bucket of fruit to, to the station, dump the fruit in as they normally would, and then they literally just had to scan the, the wristband at the reader. And Giannis designed this, that it would say, okay, I know exactly who that was. I know exactly how much weight you just brought in. I know that it's been 22 minutes, 30 seconds since you brought your last one. And so he generated a tremendous amount of data and allowed us to actually conclude that picker makes the biggest difference really than anything else. Um, and this technology was adopted and, and commercialized. There's a company called Second Sight Biosciences in Washington state that said, that's pretty cool. Uh, and they used the concept and it's, uh, it's called the fair pick that's being used in, in right now in, in cherries and blueberries and other systems. So one of the things we did was look at this canopy architecture deal, right? So from the top left, you've got one of those big old, the dinosaur orchards. This is gonna be a 50 to 60 year old orchard there on the top left. Uh, top right, you've got what's called a, a bush system. Uh, these are all sweet cherries. Um, bottom left is a steep leader system. In the middle, we've got UFO, and on the right, you've got a central leader. I guess there's animations on this. It's popping up automatically. But the numbers that you see coming up here are the data that we generated in kilos per person per minute. And so you can see these old systems are, are pretty slow, uh, about a pound per person per minute. And as you move into the higher densities, a little bit faster, a little bit faster, a little bit faster here. But this one in the bottom center, the star of the, of the trial was the UFO in a V trellis configuration. And it's fairly intuitive why, right? Everything was right there in front of you. There was no sophistication in placing the ladder. You could simply just move it down along with you as you went and, and, and get 50 to 60% of the fruit from the, from the ground, move up the ladder and get the rest of them. So we were looking at that issue and documented the differences that architecture makes. 
um, and in the individual picker. I want to get into now some of the work that we've done, taking somewhat of a longer term approach um, and also re-emphasize the importance of, of harvest uh, costs in the production budgets. So how we've addressed this in the last 12 years or so um, is in two paths. One is a fully mechanical harvest approach and one is a mechanically assisted shake and catch approach. The robotic harvest process has garnered a lot of attention, a lot of interest in apples. And this is uh, from my colleagues work. This is a, a, a prototype developed at WSU and tested at WSU with an older school robotic arm. You know, you pick the fruit, it drops it on the ground. This is obviously that's not, not what we would do normally You'd catch it somehow. Um, but the robot, first of all, it can find the fruit, so that's good. And it can reach out and approach the fruit adequately with this three fingered process, actually grab it and, and remove it. So that was the earliest. Um, and you can see some sophisticated articulation there to approach the fruit from the, from, the, from the right angle. Second generation was a little bit better, different arm. And you see it's actually dropping it into a little cup there. <laughs> so it makes a little bit more sense. But look at that fruiting wall apple orchard, right? Sometimes you look at these blocks at harvest, and it's almost more apples than leaves. They're just all out there and exposed and readily accessible. Beautiful system for, uh, uh, for robotic harvest. Major concerns are related to well, how fast can it work? How accurate is it? I mean, how, what percentage of the fruit do you actually recover? Robustness is a huge deal, huge deal. Those two arms that you saw would, would fall apart in, 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 in a commercial scenario. Uh, they're not transportable. You couldn't throw them in the back of a truck and move it to the next orchard, et cetera. A lot, that's, a, that's a very big deal. Um, damage to the, to the fruit, damage to the plant, cost and, and, and adoption. These are all issues. You see some examples of where there was uh, a slice to that particular fruit, a serious bruise on that particular fruit from that, from that process. And these are limiting factors to the, to the adoption. Has anybody heard of Abundant Robotics? This is a company that got a lot of uh, international press and that their system is in the photograph here of, um, of the first commercial robotic apple harvest. They did it in New Zealand about two years ago. Um, and so you'd say, well, where are they now? Uh, and they're defunct. They couldn't get uh, uh, any, any further funding to support the, uh, the final stages for commercialization. Um, and they had a very sophisticated system, as you can see. It actually used suction. So there wasn't a, a, a gripper or a grabber. They actually literally sucked the fruit off the tree and decelerated them quickly and put them into a, into a bin. They were famous also. They had $10 million investment from Google Ventures. So everybody said, wow, this is, this is really cool. This is going to happen. And it didn't. I think that sort of underscores the complexity uh, of, of the challenge. You know what the other thing is, personally, this is my feeling. Gosh, you know, picking apples is so efficient for people. The way that the, the, the way that the orchards have come together, and you go into a modern apple block, and and literally, it's just you, it's it's pretty straightforward. The problem, of course, is in their value prop propositions, there aren't enough people to do it, and that's true, right now. Even though they're very efficient, there just aren't enough people. Without guest worker visa programs, Washington doesn't pick. Um, I don't know what, maybe upwards of half of, of the apples that, that we grow. We absolutely rely upon them. So that's, that's what, what, we're, what we're looking at. But apples, as I said before, right? 250, 300 grams per piece of fruit. Very planar canopies. Look at that, that modern block right there. Um, how about for cherries? We can do robotic harvest for cherries. No, I don't think so. We're going at it in a, in a, in a different way because much more complex canopy structures. The biology hasn't yet caught up to the technology and much smaller, much smaller fruit and that their fruiting habit is so different. Since Abundant uh, have left the scene, um, actually they overlapped quite a bit. This is a, this is a, a CAD of a, of a company called FF Robotics has developed this uh, newer robotic apple harvester. And um, I'll show you what that looks like here. This is it. I just took these literally just the other day. It was out in the block as they were doing their field testing. Um, and it's comprised of, of six platforms, uh, three on each side. Now within each platform are two robotic arms, but they're far less sophisticated than a full range or six degrees of freedom arm. They ha this has six degrees of freedom, but it's from the platforms. Each platform can move up and down independently. 
and it can move laterally independently. And then each arm just moves out, but on a fixed angle, a fixed degree of approach to the, to the canopy. And you'll see that on the right here, this video works. So this is just one example, the arms reaching out. It's a three fingered grabber. By the way, I don't know if you saw it, but another apple just fell to the ground as they grabbed, as they grabbed that first one. And it drops onto a little collecting conveyor right there. So actually seeing an example of three apples picked consecutively in reasonable time. It took me a long time to get that video. So many fails right, on the way to getting there. <clears throat> and yes, no way. Hmm. That's a good point. I should show some videos of, of professional apple pickers picking fruit. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and their challenges, right? This is the third generation of their robotic apple harvester. Uh, a lot of challenges. And they're related to the integration of biology. You know, uh, the, the, the orchard structure here was, was quite complicated. It wasn't a planar system. Fruit weren't like that, like the previous photo I showed you with abundant, all right there. They were probably recovering 25, 30%, maybe. In, in other words, they were only able to see that many, that much of the fruit. A lot of it's occluded with, with leaves or with other branches and simply the, just the arm can't get to it. Sometimes what would happen is an arm would reach out and grab one fruit and it would start to pull on it and it would snap off and then two or three other fruit would fall from that vibrational actuation. There was a lot of fruit, a lot of fruit on, the, on the ground in that situation, but promising at least, at least there's investment in, in pursuit of that, of that goal. As you can see the other fruit, I think drop in the background, right? Now, yeah. So what are we doing with cherries? I got to acknowledge first these guys. This is Dr. Don Peterson on the left with this fruit retention forest gauge and his technician, Scott Wolford. These guys are from USDA uh, in, in West Virginia. The, both have, re have retired, but we began some collaborative work with them years ago, taking this. This was the system that they built and designed actually for peaches was their, was their goal originally. This is gonna be a peach mechanical harvester. We brought it out when it, when it failed in peaches. We brought it out to Washington and worked with it and, and modified it uh, to work for, for, for sweet cherries. This is a, it's a mirror image system, right? There's a left and a right, and they combine at the base with these spring-loaded fish scales that you can see. And the operator used to sit in that chair. Now we've we made it all remote control with hydraulic remote control. But it's a catching and collecting conveyor. So you, you, his design, it would actually smash the branch. He, he always, Dr. Peterson always described it as removing the branch from the fruit that you're popping it back and then the fruit would, would drop uh, onto that catching and collecting in there, fill, 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 fill the uh, bins in, in the field. And um, so here's another look at it. This is a fully mechanical harvest. There are two people right now, one, one per side. Um, and it's a longer term prospect simply because it requires a wide trellis orchard configuration. If your blocks don't look like, like this one on the left, it's not gonna work. That's fairly intuitive. We, we, we prove that though, by going to a, a central leader tree and, and shaking those, and of course having fruit fall and bounce from branch to branch to branch, land in the collecting conveyor and be, and be useful. Because the vision here is for fresh market quality fruit. Well, this work began actually with an SCRI in 2009, 2010 that your own Dr. Dingo was a, was a key part of. Um, and it has not been adopted today because of that reason. The chairs, there's very few orchards that are configured to this Y architecture. We're moving towards that. In fact, that's the motivation a lot behind the UFO. This is, these are not coincidences, right? The whole, the whole process coming together is, is, is the key. However, the one data point, one point, when we did larger scale field testings, there was a 50 fold improvement. So if you were driving this machine and shaking branches, putting them into the bin, versus you with a picking bucket and a ladder, you're gonna pick 50 times more fruit with this system. And it yields stem-free cherries, as you can see in this photo. Do you think, does anybody have a problem with that? All right, I like the stems. I like this. That's good. No, well, I'll get into this a little bit. So here's this, this is a UFO orchard that we, uh, one of my research blocks years ago uh, established for mechanical harvest. It's a very flat Y uh, and it worked uh, very, very well with this machine. 
blockchain, where we're getting 95% fruit recovery. Um, a few instances of where fruit were left on the tree, but not very much. And we were sending out for independent analyses of bruising and damage, and we had less bruising and damage than hand-picked fruit. Um, so when everything comes together, let's say just right, it, it's, uh, it's, it's particularly compelling, yet it's not been adopted commercially yet. In the interim, there are all kinds of orchards that are not configured to Y shapes, all kinds of different shapes and structures. So we've been working on harvest systems that are mechanically assisted, and essentially comprised of a shaker and a catcher. This is some photos here with a, actually literally with a, with a bed sheet between two PVC poles as our catching frame and, and a grower we were working with with the olive harvester, off the shelf olive harvester. It's gas powered steel SP200. Somebody's got a little hook on the end and you shake it. Uh, and fruit fly. I mean, they come off the tree. We know that, you can, and you can catch them. I think it was a mistake to use a white sheet because you know any damage looked looked really bad. That she didn't look very good after about ten minutes. Um, versus bubble, <laughs> like some bubble wrap <laughs> on PVC. And then there's a student in the top left who's, who's holding up sort of the more of the later, uh, new and improved catching frame prototypes. It's extendable so that you don't need any ladders. You can reach up to a twelve foot top of the tree. And it has a collection tube in it there. I don't know if you can see that. So the fruit would land on this net and then roll slowly into this collection tube. Here's a slow-mo video of some of the earlier students working in our UFO block and mechanically harvesting cherries. And obviously that's, we don't do that. I'm going to drop them on the ground and then, and then rake them up. But that was just some of the earlier testing. I don't think, yeah, shoot, these videos don't work. On the right, these were slow-mo videos where you can see we put a number on each of the fruit. We were looking at, well, how are they getting damaged? And right, looking at different frequencies of agitation and different durations of agitation and saying, well, where and when are we getting fruit damaged? And <clears throat> these would have demonstrated that top right didn't work at all and the bottom right worked brilliantly. Top right is Chelan, which is a genotype, which I'll show you in a moment, is very high pedestal to fruit retention. Right? In other words, the fruit don't want to come off that stem. And the bottom right is Skeena, totally different genotype, where they develop a natural abscission zone towards harvest. They come very cleanly off the stem. So our next generations have been looking at handheld battery powered reciprocating saws, where we put this modified end effector on them now. These are cheap, essentially off the shelf. Um, and the combining that with these fruit catching systems. And when we've gone out, this is Siraj, another uh, graduate student, we have in larger scale studies, we've found three to four times faster. And that's counting for picking crews, like there's gonna be two of you at least. Although we've, we found that maybe even three because you can shake the fruit off the tree so quickly, you need to have two people with catching frames running back and forth to fill the, fill the bins. So our data have um, looked pretty good. This is a video taken um, this year, cider apple harvest. We just got some funding for our state department of ag to say, hey, we, we've been trying to work this on a difficult prospect, maybe fresh market quality, undamaged cherries. Do you wanna use this on a processed piece of fruit like a cider apple? And so this is another one of my master's students, a slow-mo video shaking Wixen's cider apples, especially cider apple. Um, and in that you know, second, you can get a feel for how well it works. We were getting 95 to 98% fruit removal. Uh, and uh, yeah, the fruit were bruised, the more bruising than picking by hand, but it was seven times faster than picking by hand. And so if you're not, I don't know if you're any familiar with the cider process, if you're not sweating the fruit, right? Letting them sit uh, in, in a storage before processing, which nobody in Washington does, if they're going straight into to, uh, to pressing, it doesn't matter if they're bruised. So we're, we're, we're continuing on that actually right, right now, working on that. Bring it to horticulture too in this, this systems approach and having all, all aspects investigated, you gotta remember the uh, abscission, right? We're talking about this harvest process, which is taking fruit off the tree, taking fruit off the stem, off the spur. Abscission is, is, is critical to, to, to the success. And this is some data from Dr. Dinger's lab and Shauna wrote this paper uh, just a year ago. What we found was that there were three different uh, classes of, of genotypes those which were um, uh, inducible. So you could, with an exogenous treatment, in this case with ethophon to uh, hasten the maturity in the incision zone, you could get the retention force below a threshold that would be very good for mechanical harvest. That's that dashed line that's on there. 
There were others, Bing is an example of that. Naturally, Bing doesn't come off the stem too well, but if you go about two weeks before harvest, give it a shot of uh, PGRs, you can get it to release. Chelan is that cultivar that is uninducible. See that, see that never doesn't get close to that dotted line. It's too hard to pull it off. It'll never work for machine harvest. And then we have other categories. The one that we're particularly interested, of course, we call auto It means that they naturally create an abscission zone. In fact, when you pick them by hand, pickers complain because they, they're popping off, literally popping off the stem, which right now is a bad thing. We're, 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 we're trying to change minds about that. And I'll summarize actually a lot of work with that one maybe uh, bold statement, consumers will purchase stem-free cherry. Here's a picture of us running some of the machine harvested fruit over a commercial packing line. We've done a lot of work on this actually, investigating it because a lot of growers said, no, people aren't gonna buy cherries without stems. To which I would say, yeah, probably true. There are some people who will. There's a lot of people who will. And right now it's not an option. This is just an example of some of the consumer preference studies, right? We did a lot of point of sale uh, interactions and saying, hey, try these fruit with stems and without stems, and what do you think? So this was, which product did you prefer? Stemmed, 44 said, I prefer with stems. 55 said, I prefer stem free. 2% said both. Both shouldn't admit an answer. I don't know who designed the study. You can't prefer both, can you? 1% refused, refused to answer that, that, that question. And then of course, the, the, the question was, how much are you gonna pay? So the thought was, oh, well, maybe people will buy them, but they're not going to pay the same price. They're going to pay, they're going to pay less. And what we found was 75% uh, said, I'll pay the same price as with or without stems, it doesn't matter. 14% um, said, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I want to pay less. The group that we're really interested in, though, is this 8%. For obvious reasons, right? If you can pick the fruits uh, four or four times faster, um, and, and, you, and you can package it just as, just as easily. In fact, the the sorting lines, all this optical sorting for fruit now in packaging processing houses, they love the idea of cherries without stems because they can look at the fruit a lot easier. Um, so we're interested in that. One of our uh, partners that commercialized this, and you say patented, this uh, concept for marketing stem-free cherry, which is this cup O cherries, um, where you can see they've got uh, this customized lid. The lid is the key to it, right? It's in a cup that fits in your, in your cup holder in your car. Uh, and yet the, the, the lid is, is, is tall. So you actually shake the cherries out one end, where there's a large hole where the cherries will fit out. And on the other side, you spit the pit into this little lid reservoir so that it's tidy and clean. Kind of neat, right? a pretty in interesting approach. But one of the goals here is that we look for novel ways of incorporating marketing into this whole process. We've talked about uh, micro perforations and heat sealed packs of mod uh, modified atmosphere. Uh, all kinds of uh, ways to, to improve the, the marketing using polylactic acid uh, compostable packages and these kinds of things too. Okay, let me finish up here. So uh, go back to these harvest efficiency studies. Uh, this, is, this shows three different approaches. Traditional right now, picking cherries with the stems on. I, I didn't show you what we did this picking by hand, but, but without the stems actually just sort of plucking them off the stems. And that that that's, makes them a lot faster actually. And then I'm showing you shake and catch with that three to four fold increase. Now I have to change the axis here to show what the potential for the machine could be. It's pretty radical. And um, so um, I've shown these data to our, to our industry and said, well, let's rethink this labor supply problem, right? That you're, we're all worried about. I think we can configure the orchards of the future to be amenable, looking at these new systems, new architectures that will facilitate the incorporation of mechanization and automation. And so as we talk about I go around the Northwest talking about orchard systems, which is important to think about the future of the blocks as you're taking out and renovating. We think these are some of the fundamental tenets to, to keep in mind. High light interception, good light distribution. All the physiologists here understand that very, very well. Compact fruiting wall with repeated processes that are easy to train people and to, to work in. High production efficiency uh, and suitable for mechanization and automation. This is a picture of one of our uh, commercial collaborators of a, of a, a V trellis UFO cherry orchard. You can see that, how, how compact it all is there. That fruiting from top to bottom suggests there's good light distribution throughout those trees and a very efficient uh, process. Okay. This is the one we have to finish all our presentations with. You know, um, 
that concludes the presentation. I, uh, Oh, awesome. And in fact, if there are no questions, I thought I would put some questions for you guys because I was anticipating more of a graduate student uh, audience. Um, and these are some things that we think about in our lab group and I sort of push, push the students a bit to think about. So we don't have to get into this now, maybe later tonight at, at, at dinner or something like that. Um, but things for you guys to think about as you're doing your work or what I'm, what I'm talking about here. I've also put our Facebook page up and if you want to follow. Thanks so much again for the for the invitation and the opportunity to meet some of you and get to know about Texas A&M a bit better in this in this area. I'm really uh, really excited to see what you guys have going on here. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to get into those now. Yeah. Can the can the Zoom people hear your question, or do I need to repeat that? No, you probably repeat it. Repeat it. Uh, the question was whether or not the fair pick system was utilized to incentivize pickers, or was utilized rather just to reimburse by pound instead of by bucket. Is that right? In fact, I'm embarrassed I didn't make that clear. That was really the goal to was to pay by the pound because farmers get paid by the pound, right? As the fruit goes to the packing shed, it gets weighed. And so they say, oh, you brought in X thousands of pounds of fruit. And then the price of course is determined later, but they weigh it coming in and they have been paying by piece rate. So that whole system incentivized pickers, if you're being paid by piece rate, incentivize a picker to bring in as underfill the bucket as possible, right? That's probably just human nature. If you're going to get paid for a piece, the, le the least that I can bring into a bucket to get credit for a bucket is good for me. So that creates a lot of conflict in the orchards. Literally creates fights. Uh, I've seen it and, 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 and people complaining about, oh, over there, they're letting them bring in underfill buckets and uh, we can't hear, we have to fill up. It, was, it created a lot of problems. So the main goal was to reimburse by the pound. So if you bring in half a bucket, no problem. You get, you get credit for half a bucket. You're getting credit for exactly how many pounds you bring in. Your question about incentives is a really good one. I think it could or could go there. The systems that we were working on would have provided those data in real time to the cloud. So if you're the manager, you could be sitting at your desk and you could literally be tracking every picker in your block, how fast they're doing and how well they're doing. Now you, logistics of, of, of just handling of fruit. Also, the packing shed could know, oh, there's... There's so many tons coming in. We need to anticipate that and plan for that. Right now, they don't really. But there's a lot of ways that you could use those data um, that are not right now. It's really just to pay by bill. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yep. And in fact, the pickers, uh, the pickers prefer it too um, because they get, it's fair. That's why they put that into the name, right? The fair pick. Um, we were actually suggesting you should call it the fair way with W-E-I-G-H, but they went with fair pick uh, because it's more convenient, right? So it, next available tree to place and then pick. But if you walk right past the bin, you could take the 10, 12 pounds or whatever it is, quickly get reimbursed for that and empty the bucket for it. Maybe you don't have to carry 20 pounds. Sorry, I'm going off a bit on this, but we've seen accidents where you got 20 pounds and you're up, you're 10 feet in the air. Think about just the physics of that as you're leaning over to grab those fruit now, that's when the accidents happen. Maybe even people who can't or don't want to pick 20 pounds all the time, now you extend your workforce through that avenue. There's a lot of, a lot of opportunities there. So the question was about um, how to secure sustained funding to, to pursue this kind of uh, this kind of research. Um, and I guess yeah, I kind of put one of the questions up here, something related to that. number three about yeah, you, you asked also about the role of private companies. Yes. Uh, um, 
It, yeah, it's a good question. We have had uh, funding. We had a four-year SCRI uh, to look at everything, basically, that I was just describing to you. Um, and we have pursued it more recently with specialty crop block grants. Uh, we also have a very strong and supportive uh, commodity commission in Washington State, the Tree Fruit Research Commission. They annually fund, uh, have a budget of more than a million dollars for apples, usually about 300, 350,000 just for sweet cherry research. So there's a, quite, a, quite a good pot there. And we've had support over the years um, to, to pursue it further. Yeah. And um, I think it's a really good question. And I would pose that, especially for the grad students to think about this is what's the role that I often find myself asking that. What, are, what is our university researcher play? We began, it's just a quick aside here, we began at our, at, our, at our Center for Precision and Automated Ag Systems to put together a white paper, a roadmap for robotic harvest of apples 10, 12 years ago. And we were completely leapfrogged by private industry. They got in there with, with separate private investment, VC funding, millions of dollars, and their only goal is to put together a commercially saleable model or a unit, um, whereas university isn't, right? We, want, we also want to we also want to train grad students, write papers, and write grant proposals, these other things. So it's interesting. I see much more, much more involvement from private industry now, and it'll be hard to compete. So we actually look for ways to, to partner more than, more, than, more than compete with private industry. That one that I showed you, the FF robotics with, this, with the arms, we, we put in an SCRI to work with these guys. We want to do a multi-purpose robotic system, right? So its only function isn't just picking apples. That, hey, you can put on heads on the end of that that, uh, that spray, for example, or that uh, maybe show just the pruning, put these pruners on the end of that and go in and with six arms and start pruning. Um, complicated prospect, but partnering with private industry, we think is going to be a, a good way forward too. Thanks. So the question was whether or not the whole tree shaking would damage a cherry tree. And I, I didn't have time, sorry, to show you the videos of how that one works. It isn't a whole tree shaker. There's actually an arm that's controlled and maneuvered up against the branches. And then it, we, we changed it from a rapid displacement actuator, which was really a punch to the limb, to a vibrational actuation. Um, and that doesn't, doesn't induce damage. Also one of the reasons behind the UFO, right? You've got these unbranched uh, fruiting, fruiting wood, right? So you can shake this branch and the vibration is generally isolated to that branch and you're not dropping fruit where you don't want to and missing the, the catching frame. Um, but we ha haven't seen with the vibrational actuation, we see no long-term damage to the trees. But we haven't done a long-term study, right? In years over years after years with it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So Tim's asking about uh, damage that manual picking does to trees by spur removal. Absolutely, absolutely. And leaf, this is an interesting one, leaf removal too. So you, you, you look at some of these cherry orchards after a crew has gone through and the floor is littered with leaves that cover with them because typically, right, what'll happen is they'll pluck off a spur. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with, with the cherry fruiting habit, your flower buds for next year are right there. They're on that spur. So if you pluck that off, you're taking away next year's crop and it's, and it's uh, very much uh, frowned upon. So yeah, manual operations, they do that. We evaluated that with the shake and catch. We've never removed a single spur with shake and catch. Sorry, the back, you have been waiting. Um, Yeah, the question was how much uh, genotypes play a role in the relation of a genotype and its phenotype and the suitability for those modern architectures, right? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good way to think about it. And the, the short answer is definitely plays a role. Um, there are certain genotypes that, uh, that are perfectly suited to the UFO system. And generally speaking, the reason that I designed that structure was because it, it takes advantage of the general cherry, cherry growth habit, very acrotonic growth, apical dominant, not a lot of lateral branching, um, and growers in other architectures, you just fight that, you fight the natural growth habit. I show you pictures of, of, of orchards in Spain and in Chile, even in, in, in Washington, where there's 
meters and meters of twine and rope in each tree because they're taking these branches that want to go like that and they're, they're bending them down like that so that it can be more fruitful so they're fighting it so the upright growth habit is well suited there are exceptions there are some varieties that aren't especially well suited to the ufo system and it makes a difference So the question was whether or not you could mechanize the pruning on the inside of a V trellis canopy. And the answer is no, no, you cannot. No, uh, that's how we looked at, for me, the, the, the thought process or the idea of we need to move towards these fruiting wall systems came a long time ago, we're trying to get there. And then the question was, well, should they be vertical or should they be V? Right? That, that, for me, that was the training systems question. Um, and we studied that and had a really cool uh, PhD project looking at light interception and productivity of vertical versus V. V have higher yield potential. And that, that largely comes down to light interception, right? I tell the farmers this all the time. Light's the most important input into your orchard and it's free. Capture it, right? Turn that into, into, into chemical energy, get into the fruit. And... Uh, V trellises is as oh, very intuitive, just they just capture more light uh, than, than vertical walls. You, you know, at solar new and a vertical system, it, it actually captures very little light. Uh, but growers are still planting vertical walls because they can't mechanically shear the Vs. So they say, well, we're gonna we're gonna have maybe a little bit less potential, but we can we can use machine pruning in our vertical. Any other questions? Go for it. Yeah. No. Hmm. Right. Um, so the question was whether or not the um, the inducible trait is is, uh, or whether it is something that you could select for. Or gene editing. Okay. Right. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, it's possible, right? It's possible. Um, from that work that we did, I, I think that the, by far the most compelling category is the auto upsizing, where you don't have to mess around with any plant growth regulators. There, are, there can be um, uh, collateral effects of, of, of ethophon, for example, and a lot of growers are worried about that because you know it's, it's a ripening releases ethamine as a ripening hormone that gets softening the fruit and other things that they're concerned about. So we'd really rather stay away from inducibles altogether. In our cherry breeding program, as you're well aware, we have a, a, a well-defined 10% effort is put into uh, uh, selecting for that trait of low pedicel fruit retention or the auto upsizing. So we're trying to develop a line, a future line of cherries that, that would be auto upsizing. And that's kind of where we're investing the energy. Hmm. The question is about uh, potential downsides to this auto upsizing trait. And I would say no, uh, we haven't seen any. Uh, th this trait, I, I showed you the one genotype is called Skeena. It comes from the British Columbia, Canada breeding program. They have somehow, maybe I would know better than I would, uh, the, the genetic background in there, but many of their released genotypes have this trait low pedestal fruit retention force or auto upsizing. It's not to the point that a high wind or anything they would actually drop. Um, I wouldn't be concerned about that, but uh, they're all commercially released for all the other great traits that they have as being productive, as being large and firm and sweet, good flavor. So that trait isn't, we haven't seen it necessarily associated with anything negative yet. 